This program is made possible by the partners and friends of Bob Yandian Ministries. Coming up on this episode of Student of the Word. Looking at the circumstances is temporary right now, but looking at the answer is looking down the road and understanding God's going to bring me out of this. And so joy looks forward to the fact that God is going to bring you out of it. The Bible says, who for joy, that was Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. He could have just looked at the cross and got depressed. He could have looked at the nails in his hand and got depressed. He could have felt sorry for himself, but you know what? He looked ahead and saw the joy that was set before him, which was you and me. He saw you saved and me saved. He saw us accepting him as Lord and Savior. And for that joy, he endured the cross. Joy helps you endure persecution. Joy helps you to withstand. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Good morning and welcome again to Student of the Word with Pastor Bobby Andy. We began two days ago teaching on the subject of suffering and it's part of the Christian life. And uh, we've been teaching for the past couple of days from my series called Victory in Adversity. And of course, what I've got is a condensed version here. And I really would like you to have that series right there because it'll help you understand life, help you to understand your authority. And there's people that say, well, we don't have any adversity in life. Well, then why did God give you weapons? We don't have any enemies in life. Well, then why is there adversity in life? And why did Jesus and Paul and Peter and others talk so much about adversity as well as those of the Old Testament? And so the word of God is consistent. We live in the devil's world. And so again, I want you to have a copy of that. We will come on here at the break halftime and we will tell you about how that you can have a copy of that for yourself. And so once you turn to Matthew chapter five today, we're gonna be talking about that even though God is not the one who arranges suffering, God's not the one who brings suffering, he uses it in his plan. And, uh, you know, uh, if you got a good investment plan, you understand that, uh, you know, that uh, that when the market's going up, you're gaining money, gaining money, gaining money. And then all of a sudden, when the market goes bad, you know, you think, well, I'm losing money. Well, what they're doing is they've got a plan. They've got a plan. They know bad times will come. And a good investment company has a plan for what to do whenever things go down. When things go down, the prices of things drop. And what happens is, is your, your value spreads out this way. Even though it looks like it went down, what happened is the wise investor knows that the certain ones that go down are going to go back up. So they purchase those for you so that whenever you go up, at first you were going up with a little margin like this, but after a while it spreads out because now you have enough money where you got a whole lot of stock rising and next time your increase is better. This is what God knows about the things of life. He knows about the adversities of life. And this is why he has plans for adversity coming into your life, knowing that, you know, your investment company doesn't make the economy go down. There's things that make the economy to go down. There's wars that go on. There's inflation, depression, all the different things that go on around us. And it causes the market to fluctuate. But overall, we see the market trending up. That's the way God's life is. It's always trending up. And there are times of downturn, but the Lord can take that and has a plan for it to where you can get around it. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all because we are in the devil's world. And one day we won't be in the devil's world anymore. The kingdoms of this world will one day become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and forever. No devil on the earth, no demons on the earth, no religion on the earth, no curse on the earth. We will have a wonderful time then, but in the meantime, God has planned for us to have a wonderful time here in the midst of the devil's world. He prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies. How much more specific can you get? The presence of our enemies is still here. And so, again, I want you to have a copy of that. And find Matthew chapter 5, while you're turning there, we're going to take a look at verses 10 through 12. I want to thank you who are, again, standing with me as partners, you know, because, you know, there's adversity that comes against this ministry. But God has not only called on the Holy Spirit to help me and the promises to help me, but also people that hold up my hands. It's the same way in your life. Thank God that if two shall agree on earth, it's great to have a prayer partner. It's great to have a church you can go to. It's great to have a bunch of people who will stand with you in your times of adversity. And whenever you're sick, you can go to church. And, and the question can be asked, is there any sick among you? Let's call for the elders of the church. We can gang up on it. All I can tell you is it's so good to know I have a gang behind me that can gang up on these problems and gang up with me. And we can come together as a united front against the things of Satan. And of course, on the other hand, we have a united front that can build up the things of God's reserves in my ministry. And that's reserves of prayer, reserves of faith, but also reserves of finances. And so if you're not a partner with me, I'd love you to become a partner. Join the gang. 
And uh, you can become a partner with me and go to bobyandian.com. There's a place there on the face page where you can become a partner with me in the ministry. Thank you so much for even praying about it, considering it. And for those of you thinking about it right now, I look forward to you going, yes, I want to become a partner with Pastor Bob. Matthew chapter five says this, beginning in verse, uh, in, uh, verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecute the prophets who were before you. Jesus said here, he's not talking about being persecuted because you know people want to pick on you or you're, you know, you're small and the punks pick on you in school. It's all right to defend yourself in those cases. But what he's saying here is when you are cursed, and people come against you and you face adversity for righteousness sake. What it means is they pick on you because you're a Christian. They pick on you because you believe in Jesus. You believe in the word of God. And so they come against you because you seem like such a weirdo to them. On the other hand, you're convicting them inside. Jesus here was talking about the Pharisees who came against him. Jesus here was talking about even government leaders that came against him. And Jesus did not back down. He knew the father would defend him. Even on the cross, he could have called for 10,000 leagues, uh, legions of angels, but he didn't do that. And so he again knew God was going to bring him through and God resurrected him from the dead. All I can say is it may look like there's a crucifixion ahead of you, but you know what? There's always resurrection on the other side. God will take care of you. He is your defense. He is your advocate, the one who fights for you. And here in this verse of scripture, it just says, what should our attitude be in the midst of the trials and tribulations of life? Rejoice. Count it all joy when you fall into temptations and trials. That's what James told us. Count it all joy means to look at it and say, you know what? I'm going to be joyful. To make a decision, joy is a choice. You do have two choices whenever problems come against you. Number one is look defeated, get under it, worry about it, you know, hate the fact that it's going on, live by that, or else on the other hand, rejoice. Why? Because you can look past this circumstance. Looking at the circumstance is temporary right now, but looking at the answer is looking down the road and understanding God's going to bring me out of this. And so joy looks forward to the fact that God is going to bring you out of it. The Bible says, who for joy, that was Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. He could have just looked at the cross and got depressed. He could have looked at the nails in his hand and got depressed. He could have felt sorry for himself, but you know what? He looked ahead and saw the joy that was set before him, which was you and me. He saw you saved and me saved. He saw us accepting him as Lord and Savior. And for that joy, he endured the cross. Joy helps you endure persecution. Joy helps you to withstand and come against and resist what Satan is doing for you. And one thing that Satan cannot stand is a joyful, rejoicing Christian who doesn't back down from the joy and the rejoicing, no matter how many slings and arrows, no matter how many problems he throws at them, they just keep coming out victorious on the other side. Turn with me to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10 and verse 30. And here it says about the one who follows him and forsakes everything. I mean, you know, there comes a time you look at your home, your family and all that. God's got a call on your life. You're going to a Bible school. Uh, your parents think you're weird. They think you're joining a cult. They think you're, you know, you've deserted the Baptist background or Methodist or Lutheran background you came out of. It's us. It's your grandma. It's your great grandma. We've all attended this church here. And now you're turning away from all this. You're turning away from your family. But you know, Jesus is simply saying, let me be that. Let me be your home. Let me be your parents. Let me be your mom. Let me be your dad. And uh, let me be your home that you, you know, that you depend on. All these different things you've depended on. He wants to be your, fin your financial director. He wants to be your joy, the one that brings joy into your life. He wants to one that bring fulfillment. And where people want to do this, God says, let me do that. But you have to desert them first. And so in Mark chapter 10 and verse 30, he said, this is the one who does forsake houses, homes, lands, friends, moms, dads, and says, but he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecution. In other words, yes, you're going to prosper in life, but guess what? Satan's going to come against you because he knows you're going to use that prosperity to help win people to the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what he doesn't like. So here it says again, you're going to receive it with persecution. We often talk about give it shall be given unto you. Yes, God's going to give it back to you. But you know what's going to happen? Satan's going to resist you. Satan's going to persecute you. And the point of it is he wants you to give up on this whole thing. But you make a choice not to give up. Look at Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21, beginning in verse 12. And here it says, 
Jesus promising what's going to happen to the disciples after Jesus has gone. Luke chapter 21 and verse 12, but before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and to the prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. Let it, in, and it shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle it therefore in your hearts not to meditate before what you shall answer. So here he declares, they're going to bring you before magistrates. You're, listen, but for being a Christian, you're not only going to suffer from the religious crowd, you're going to suffer from the government crowd. And the religious leaders are going to bring you before them. And the government leaders, because why? They see you as a threat. They see you as something that's going to pull away and start something on your own, and they don't want that. So they're going to bring you in. He says, and listen, it's going to happen to you. And, and understand, there are times you have to submit to the government. There's times, and always have a submissive attitude toward the government, because God has set them there. But if they ever ask you to do, or even demand that you do, something contrary to what God has called you to do into the work of the Lord, then you politely say, no. Again, with a non-resistant attitude, with still a submissive attitude, you say no. This happened in Acts chapter 3 and Acts chapter 4. The leaders of the church were brought in and they were persecuted and told not to preach again ever in the name of Jesus. And they didn't stand up and go out and cause a riot. They didn't go out and have people standing on the street corners with signs. They didn't bring together a, a, a group of people just to protest. That was not their in plan. No, they stood up in front of those men and said, sirs, no, this is great respect, sirs, whether to obey you or to obey God, in that case, we have no choice. Any other thing where it's simply a matter of government, we will submit to you. But when you tell us we need to go against the word of God, we cannot do that. They said, sirs, whether to obey you or whether to obey God, we have no choice. We will obey God. And they went back to the church, reported all that had been done to them, and God confirmed it by sending an earthquake. And this was his stamp of approval on what the disciples had done. And they went out and preached again in the name of Jesus. Signs, wonders, and miracles accompanied their ministry. Look at John chapter 15 and take a look at verse 20. Here Jesus speaking to his disciples again says, remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Jesus said, you're taking on my ministry. You're taking on my place. I'm the son of God. I came to this earth and you're not the son of God. I will make you sons and daughters in the family, but I am the son of God. God come to earth in the flesh, and yet they persecuted me. Well, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. But notice again, he's told us before, rejoice, be exceeding glad. And in the midst of all these things, keep your joy ever before the Lord. Let them see a joyful attitude. We see this in the case where Stephen was stoned to death in Acts and in chapter 6. And in chapter seven, where he was preaching, he was stoned to death. And at the end of his sermon, they stoned him. But you know what? He looked up to heaven and said, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. And in that case, he asked the Lord to forgive them of their sins, just like Jesus on the cross asked God to forgive them of their sins as they crucified him. And so because of that, again, we see the great attitude there. And that even infuriates those that comes against us even more when we don't knuckle under and we don't submit to them and we don't renounce Jesus in front of them. And this happens worldwide for people who are persecuted for the gospel's sake. And in heaven, there is even a martyr's reward. And there's a, there's a throne up there. And underneath that throne, underneath the altar in front of the throne, the martyrs are there crying out, Lord, when will you ever avenge us? When we come back from the break, again, we're going to take up from this point. You can already begin to turn to Romans chapter 8 because that's where we're going. But again, you're going to now find out how you can have this particular series on victory and adversity. See you after the break. Do you ever wonder why it is that so many people, even very good people, go through so much suffering, so many trials, and all those tribulations in their lives on this earth? Or maybe you've encountered people who lay the blame on God for all the suffering that occurs in the world. What answers do you have for them? Victory in Adversity is a powerful four-part series from Pastor Bob Yandian that will give you insight into the reasons that people suffer and show you how to gain complete victory over all the trials, tribulations, and adversity of life. You can walk through this life on the earth with complete victory as more than a conqueror. To order Victory in Adversity, visit bobyandian.com or call 918-250-2207. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. 
You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership or call us at 918-250-2207. If you would like to schedule Bob Yandian to speak at your church, event, or conference, go to bobyandian.com forward slash invite or call 918-250-2207. Welcome back again. Let's go to Romans chapter 8 because this is one of the best scriptures telling us about the fact that we're going to be persecuted and what should be our attitude in the midst of persecution. Romans chapter 8 and verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I want you to notice what he promises we're going to go through. He said we're going to go through distress, we're going to go through tribulation. That's just pressures. The word thlipsis, which is used for the word tribulation, is talking about pressure. And it's used for taking and putting something under your finger and pressing as hard as you can. It was also used in the ancient world for putting a giant weight on somebody, just letting it go and go until it crushed them. And they were on that crushing weight, this gigantic stone that was placed on top of them. It was a form of torture and death. And here it says, shall that type of tribulation, pressure from every side, how about distress, not knowing what to do. You're in a situation, I don't know whether to turn this way or that way. Listen, Listen, when you don't know what to do, fall back on what you do know. Don't throw away what you know because of what you don't know. In times when you don't know what to do, fall back on what you do know. There's so many scriptures that start with I know. I know my Redeemer lives. I don't know what to do in this situation. I am so confused. I've never seen something come at me from so many different directions. I've got accusations. I don't know where they came from. And in the midst of all this, there's a temptation to throw away the entire Christian life, everything you've ever learned. No, that's a time to fall back on what you absolutely do know. And by falling back on what you do know prepares time for God to show you what you don't know then that will add to what you do know. So what you do know will grow greater and greater and fall back on what you do know. I know my Redeemer lives and will one day stand upon this earth. I know in whom I have believed and am persuaded he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. And I know that all things work together for good to those that love God. In fact, that was the verses before this, that all things will work together for those that love God and those that are called according to his purpose. You stick with God's word and you stick with your calling and you continue to quote God's word at the situations of life and this is what's gonna happen to you. So again, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? It's Satan that's trying. It's the world around us that's trying. He says, first of all, shall pressures from every side stop it? Well, the answer is no. How about distress, not even knowing where to turn? Confusion is a better word for distress right here, or persecution. This comes from a particular group of people, not from every direction, one person or a group of people coming at you. In Jesus' case, this could be the Pharisees. This could be the leaders of uh, the Roman Empire that came against him. Next of all, or famine, lack of food. Next of all, nakedness, lack of clothing. In peril, this means distresses, dangers all around you. They're trying to break into your house. Thieves are around you, next of all, or sword. This is war. You could be called to go to war or else your nation's in the midst of war. It goes on to say there, who shall separate from the love of God? Well, tribulation can't separate you from the love of God. Distress can't separate you from the love of God. Persecution, in fact, even if you decide to give up, you still haven't separated yourself from the love of God. The moment you got born again, his love poured out on you it remains forever and forever. Verse 36, and as it is written, for your sake we are killed all the day long, we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Notice it doesn't say we are sheep for the slaughter. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. The world looks at us, Satan looks at us and sees us as Christians, which means to them, we look weak. We look like we could easily be taken. 
but a believer who stands on the word will still be standing on the word after the persecution's over. You know, I can't think of this without thinking about the cartoon where the uh, coyote comes against, you know, over the hill and looks and there's all those sheep down there. And he looks at the sheep, he doesn't see sheep. He sees lamb chops roasting on a spit over a fire. That's what he sees. Those sheep look like they're so innocent, so easy to take. And he's gonna run down there and get one. So he runs down the hill to get them. And guess what? He meets face to face, Sheepdog. Sheepdog is Jesus. Sheepdog is our Holy Spirit. And we're down there, uh, again, in the midst of our enemies, enjoying the grass, enjoying the field, looking around. We're surrounded by enemies all the time, but we know one thing. I don't trust in me. I trust in God. I am a sheep. I am a child of God, but I am not a sheep for the slaughter. I may look like a sheep for the slaughter, but I am not. Notice again, he says, we are accounted. We look like sheep for the slaughter. No, I love that word. No, he's simply saying to tribulation, no, to distress, no, to persecution, no, famine, nakedness, peril, sword, no. And whenever Satan looks at me and thinks he can come against me and destroy me so easily as a, a coyote does or a wolf does or whatever against sheep, God just simply says, no. He says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. This should be our attitude. Our attitude should first of all be joy. We've already covered that. In fact, we looked at verses, but the next of all is no. I am protected by God and nothing that comes against me is bigger than the Jesus in me. In other words, if Satan comes to attack me, I just introduce him to my friend standing right over here, Jesus Christ himself through the power of the Holy Spirit. And the name of Jesus has been given to me. So he has to back off. I've seen those stories before where it's actually actually true cases where they showed on films and stuff and they and depict it and show times where uh, the Israelis were fighting during the Six Day War and the, name, and the uh, enemy coming against them suddenly saw the heavens filled with giants and it was angels. And that I remember one time preaching, a lady came to me and said, I was watching while you were preaching. She said, did you know that there was a nine foot giant angel standing right behind you? I said, no, she said, yes. And then she said, he was glowing with God's glory. Whenever you walk this way, he walked that way, walk this way, he walked that way. And he was there. She said, I saw him all the time. Well, that's what Satan sees. He looks at me, then suddenly looks behind me and goes, oh my goodness, there's sheepdog Jesus back there. There's sheepdog giant angel back there to protect him and watch over him. So that's why he says in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Notice this, I'm not a conqueror. I am more than a conqueror. This is how we need to see ourselves in the midst of trials and persecution. What do I look at a trial and understand? I'm bigger than the trial. You know, there were, there were uh, spies that went into the land. 10 came back with an evil report and two came back with a good report. What did they see when they went over there? Giants. What was wrong with the 10 that came back? They compared themselves to the giants and said, we are but grasshoppers in their sight. But the two that came back with a good report compared the giants to a bigger giant, God. They simply said, God is well able to take this land for us. It's bread for us. Look at the size of the grapes and all, that's ours. God said it already belongs to us. They went in with an attitude, we're not gonna compare ourselves to the giants. We're gonna compare our enemy, the giants, to God. And God is a bigger giant. So there's no way our enemies could ever get bigger than God and God's on our side. If God be for me, who can be against me? Ah, great report, isn't it? Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we're going to take a look at verses 8 and 9. Here it says, we are troubled on every side. That's that thlipsis thing where you have pressure on every side of you, tribulation. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but never in despair. This comes back to, again, when you don't know what to do, fall back on what you do know. When, you, when you're facing situations you don't know, fall back on what you do know. Here it says, but not in despair. Persecuted, but never forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. This verse simply says, look at, look at this. First of all, trouble. Next of all, uh, distress. Next of all, uh, cast down. When you look at those things, you understand that every one of those things are temporary. I'm going to be cast down, but I'm going to get back up. It's not the fact you've been knocked down. It's the fact that you got back up. I don't care how many times you got knocked down. Make sure that getting up is one more time past the number of being cast down that you have faced. So it's simply saying here in this verse of scripture, know this, this is what you're going to do. This should be our attitude. I'm troubled on every side, but I'm not distressed. Next of all, I'm perplexed, but I'm not in despair. I don't know what to do, but you know what? I, the problem is God knows what to do. I don't know what the answer is, but God knows what the answer is. And if I didn't get myself into the situation and Satan got me into the situation, then God's going to get me out. And I really don't care how he gets me out. He's going to get me out. 
Next of all, persecuted, but not forsaken. I'm never forsaken. God is with me. Jesus Christ is with me. The Holy Spirit's with me. Never leave me nor forsake me. Promised he would be with me always to the end of the world. And so that's what this is saying. Next out, I've been knocked down, but you know what? I get right back up. I've been knocked down, but I've never been knocked out. I am not going to stay down. I'm gonna keep getting up until, again, I can't help but think of Rocky in this particular one where he kept getting knocked down and standing back up and knocked down and standing back up. And I mean, he just frustrated whoever he was with because he just kept doing that. And finally he outlasted them. And this is what we do with Satan. We just outlast him knowing, Satan, you are temporary. I am eternal. I know where you're eventually your eternity is going to be. You're going to be in hell. And eventually after that, the lake of fire. I'm going to be in heaven with God himself. So again, in all these things we see, he goes on to say, in that verse of scripture, we're not destroyed. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Notice what he says. You say, but the problem I'm going through is so heavy. He says, no, it's a light affliction. And you'll understand it when you come out from under it. He says, which is but for a moment, but I've had it for five years. In the light of eternity, five years will be just a moment compared to the millions of years and billions of years we're going to be in eternity. Then he goes on to say, it works for us. The more you follow God, even the problems that come against you turn around and fight for you. It's much like when people were overwhelmed, and know they're overwhelmed, they actually came over, surrendered, and even said, we will fight on your behalf against these evil people that have made us to fight for them. And this is what happens with circumstances. They turn around, they fight for us. He says, and they fight and they work for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Even the relief I'm going to have down here because the situation is over cannot even compare to the rewards I'm going to receive in heaven for enduring persecution, trials, and temptations. And they can't even compare. Next of all, it goes in to say, while, verse 18, we look not at the things which are seen, that's the problems, but the things which are unseen, that's our answers. For the things which are seen, that's the problem, are temporal or only for the moment, but the things which are not seen are eternal. My answer is eternal, although it may just bring me out of this situation, it's gonna be eternal because I'll have rewards in heaven. So it's simply saying again here, keep your eyes on God, keep your eyes on the word, keep your eyes on all these things and God will bring you through. I simply ask you right now, where do you stand? What problem are you going through? Where are your, where's your attention focused? Set your affection, your focus on things above, not on things on this earth. Get your eyes off the problem, back on Jesus Christ and understand something. I don't know how I'm gonna get out of this thing, but you know what? I'm gonna get out of this thing. I wanna pray with you right now. Come on, bow your head with me. I don't know what you're going through, but Father, I pray for them right now. I don't know what they're going through, but you do. But Father, I do add my agreement to theirs. You said, if two shall agree on earth as touching anything, it shall be done. And right now I agree. They're coming out of this thing. They're going to come out of this thing and the rejoicing is going to go to you. Not in their prayers and not in their faith, but your grace, your glory, and your power. I give you praise, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, I want you to have a copy of this. And so the announcer is going to come on and tell you how you can have a copy. And I'll see you tomorrow as we continue on this subject of understanding suffering. And in the meantime, have a great day. See you tomorrow. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact or call us at 918-250-2207. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.